Well, good to see you back. We have seen many of you yesterday uh, at the conference. And now I would like to read with you Psalm 1 and 2. Psalms 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the wicked and stands not in the way of sinners and sits not in the seat of scorners. But his delight is in Jehovah's law, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he is as a tree planted by brooks of water, which gives its fruit in its season, and whose leaf fadeth not. And all that he does prospers. The wicked are not so, but are as the chaff with which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Psalm 2. Why are the nations in tumultuous agitation, and why do the peoples meditate a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the princes plot together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us break their bonds asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that dwells in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then will he speak to them in his anger, and in his fierce displeasure will he terrify them. And I have anointed my king upon Zion, the hill of my holiness. Verse 7. I will declare the decree. Jehovah has said unto me, Thou art my son. I this day have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee nations for an inheritance, and for thy possession the ends of the earth. Thou shalt break them with a scepter of iron. As a potter's vessel, thou shalt dash them in pieces. And now, O kings, be wise, be admonished, Ye judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish in the way. Though his anger burn but a little, blessed are all who have their trust in him. So far the reading of the scriptures. Blessed is the man that walks not, Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed are all who have their trust in him. The last verse that we just read. God wants us to be blessed. To be blessed, you have to go a right way. The word blessed is really derived from a word that means right. And so the question is, are we right with God to begin with? If you're not right with God, you are not blessed. But when you have accepted the Lord by God's grace... And some of the little ones already know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Then you are blessed. But then you need to continue to trust Him. To put your trust in Him. That's an ongoing thing. So once you put your trust in Him, when you got saved. But what this verse says, verse 12, Blessed are all who have their trust in Him. That means who are keeping trusting Him. And that's a challenge for us to keep trusting Him. To keep rejoicing. To keep looking up to the Lord. Now, Psalm 1 verse 1. The question was asked, there was once uh, in Jerusalem, uh, a brother who visited there many years ago, Jewish. And he had many friends there. And he invited them to come to the Mount of Olives and then look at Jerusalem. In those days it was still in Reuben. And then they talked about Psalm 1. And he said, who is that man? Maybe Abram, the father of all believers. But then he said, did Abram always walk in the counsel of God or was he sometimes also wrong? Sometimes he was wrong. And then he said, well, maybe Moses. Moses, a man of God, the man of God. What happened to Moses in the wilderness at the end of the wilderness journey? God, the the people had complained, and God said, you know, you go and speak to the rock, and I will give water. 
But Moses was so provoked by the unbelieving people, he got so angry, he smit the rock twice. And God said, Moses, you cannot enter the promised land because you are disobedient. Even the man of God was disobedient. So then mom said, maybe David. David, the man after God's heart. Maybe it's David. But what happened to David? David was a man after God's heart. But what happened to him? He sinned in the matter of Bathsheba. He had her husband killed. Terrible. So, no, this cannot be David. And so they go on, maybe Jeremiah. But they couldn't find the answer. Now, do you have the answer? Who is this man? The Lord Jesus. He's the only one who fits this picture. There is no other one who fits this picture. But the Lord Jesus wants us to be like him. We have many verses in the New Testament that show that. That it is God's desire, once we are saved, that we learn from him. And so what do we learn from the Lord Jesus? He did not walk in the counsel of the wicked. It's interesting, verse 1 is a climax. He does not walk, it's very negative. He does not walk, he does not stand, he does not sit. But there is a climax. In evil, walking in the counsel of the wicked means that you are together with the wicked who seek wicked counsel, who seek wicked things, who stand not in the way of sinners. Sinner means that he falls short of God's purpose. And he sits not in the seat of the scorners, who mock. These are the mockers. We, we are living in the days of the mockers. Second Thessalonians shows that in other scriptures. We are living in the days of the mockers who blaspheme the name of God. That's going on in our society. And so the three knots are very important for us to not have fellowship with the wicked. We're living in a world full of wickedness. And we are different. We are the light in this world, the salt of this earth. We are not making common cause with the sinners. We're not sitting in the seat of scorners. These terrible things are taking place today. You can give many examples. I don't want to distract us from the scriptures. But there are many examples of our society that fit this picture of wickedness, of sinners, of scorners. But what the Lord wants, he wants us to be different. Well, we have the, still the, the flesh in us. We have the old nature in us. We have the sin nature in us. In ourselves, we cannot be different. That's why we had the verse in Romans 6. We need to count that we belong now to the risen one, to the Lord Jesus. We have to make that our own. What the work of Christ for us means, we have to apply it to our daily lives. And then we will follow the Lord's example. The second verse speaks about the Lord's example, his delight. So the first verse is kind of negative. What you do not do and what the Lord did not do. But the second verse is very positive. He delight, his delight is in the Lord's law. Uh, in my version here it says Jehovah. And just a little quick explanation. Um, the time that this Bible was translated, they thought that the four-letter word of Lord, often translated Lord, Yahweh, or Yahweh, should be rendered as Jehovah. Why? Because the Jews, when they read this four-letter word, they did not pronounce that name, they pronounced Adonai. So they read the four letters, but they pronounced Lord Adonai. And that's how they adopted the sounds of Adonai and brought it in the name what's now Jehovah. It is not, it's an artificial rendering. So it would be better to read Yahweh, uh, Y, H, V, H, Yahweh. That, some translations have that today. They read Yahweh. Now the Jews would not pronounce that name because they were afraid that they would pronounce the name of God in vain and that they would be guilty. But we can really read it like Yahweh. There's no problem. And honor his name. Almost 7,000 times in the Old Testament you have this name. So, but the point is, we, the, the, the Lord delighted in his law. What does that mean? Is that the law of Moses? It's implied. 
The word law really is Torah. In the Old Testament, the books of Moses are sometimes called Torah. That is, the collection of Moses' books, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, together, are called the law. But also the Old Testament in its entirety is often called Torah. Uh, the Jews have an expression, Tanakh, that means Torah. Nebim is the prophets. And then the writings, the three parts of the Old Testament that the Lord Jesus quoted in Luke 24 when he was speaking with the two disciples from Emmaus. He showed from Moses, from the prophets, and that include also the early prophets like the books of Joshua and, and Judges and so on, and the writings that include Daniel that we talked about yesterday. It includes the, the other scriptures that we have, the Psalms. And so the Lord quoted from those scriptures to show that he had to suffer and that he had to die, but also to rise from among the dead and to be glorified. So the point is now in verse 2 that the Lord Jesus, as a man on this earth, found his delight, his joy, his pleasure in God's word. So if you read law, then you, you, you tend to think of what is uh, demanding, what is um, needed, do, don'ts and do's or do's and don'ts the, the Jews counted 613 laws of you should not do and then what you would do that's the law of Moses 613 commands and then the scribes the Pharisees they added to those laws the Lord explained it in Mark's gospel for example this one law observe the Sabbath they had added 1500 laws what they should do what they should not do that's not the law here, what we find. The law here is God's word. And, of course, it implies the law of Moses, but it is much more than that. You could translate it teaching. His delight is in the Lord's teaching. The Lord is the great teacher. Job already said, who can teach as God? God, the Lord, is the great teacher. And his word is teaching. That's the meaning of this word law. And so in his teaching, that is the written word of God, what was known at that time, the Old Testament, does he meditate day and night. For us, when we apply this, we can also include the New Testament, of course. We meditate on the New Testament that is included in this instruction. Because we are now, we have the light of the New Testament that's built on the Old Testament, but it is also true for us to meditate in God's teaching which implies the New Testament. And so we should meditate in that. Not in a sense that you have to empty your mind and then, like many people teach today, to come in, into a state of emptiness and then you can be filled. That is wrong teaching. What the Lord wants is to be very active in our meditation, to think about the Word of God, to compare Scripture with Scripture. That is the meditation that you find here, day and night. You read Genesis 1 verse 1, and then you compare it with other portions of scriptures in the Psalms. And so that is what this meditation is all about. Day and night. There's no end. When you study the scriptures, we're talking with our brother Joe uh, during the break. When you study the scriptures together, you rejoice. It's joyful occupation to meditate in these scriptures day and night. We never get finished with this meditation, right? And so it is a beautiful occupation to be occupied with the Word of God and meditate it day and night. But it doesn't stop there. It produces something, and that's verse 3. If you meditate in the Word of God, God wants us to be doers of the Word. He wants us to study the Scriptures, to meditate on these Scriptures, to see the preciousness of the Lord Jesus. But then He wants us to produce fruit. Now that's verse 3. He is as a tree planted by brooks of water. The Lord Jesus was very fruitful in his life. And actually the Lord Jesus is the tree of life, as you find in Revelation. And so the Lord Jesus is everything. He's the tree of life. He works in us through his spirit so that we can produce fruit. And so what we find in the Lord Jesus in his personal life, he was the tree of life that produced fruit. Uh, brooks of water in scripture speak of the abundance of the resources we have in the word of God it is always flowing like a stream it is an abundant stream and now this tree is 
plant it there. It has the right uh, place, the right position. It's a definite thing. So it speaks of determination. When you plant a tree, you dig a hole, you put the tree there. It is a plan. And so our plan would be to be planted close to the brooks of water, close to the living word of God, like streams of water, refresh, give life, and then the miracle will take place. God will produce something in our lives, fruit. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. Ninefold fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's just an example of that fruit. The Lord wants us to be uh, producing fruit, fruit of holiness, the fruit of righteousness. That's all implied. And he wants it to produce fruit the right moment. Not too, too early, not too late, but at the right time. And so that's what we find in the Lord Jesus. He had always a word for the right moment, the right word for the right moment. That's what we learn from him as we are planted by brooks of water and produce this fruit in the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot produce fruit in our own strengths. It is through the work of the Lord Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit, and then we will persevere. It, its leaf does not fade. So it does not get old. You do, there's no decay. Sometimes you meet people in their 90s and they are fresh like young believers. It's unbelievable. That is this freshness you find here and the leaf fades not. There's no decay. And the leaf speaks of testimony, what, is, what can be seen outwardly. With Israel, the Lord met the, the, the a tree there um, when he was at the end of his life on this earth. And the tree, a fig tree, there was no fruit. There was a lot of leaves. And so that is the testimony of, of Israel. There was a lot of outward prosperity, but there was no inward prosperity. The Lord wants both. He wants to have the fruit and the leaves. Okay, and that's also for our lives. Not just an outer testimony, show off. But he wants also fruit. He wants to have both. Fruit and leaves. And then it says, all that he does prospers. You make your pros prosperous. You have success. This word, all that he does prospers. You remember the story of Joseph. Uh, Brother Sam read in, in uh, Genesis 45 about Joseph. Now Joseph, he prospered in adversity. He was in the house of uh, this uh, gentleman that bought him. And uh, Potiphar, and he was having a difficult time there, especially when his, uh, Potiphar's wife wanted to seduce Joseph. And it says he prospered in that house. And then he was thrown in prison because of the testimony of uh, Potiphar's wife, false testimony. Joseph was in prison for a number of years. We don't know exactly how long. And yet it says in Genesis 39, he prospered even in the prison. When you read uh, Joshua, Joshua enters the promised land. He's about to enter the promised land in Joshua 1. And the Lord says, if you keep my word, you will prosper. It's the same idea. You will, you will be successful. Now, today we talked about that. Do we trust the Lord? Yes. Then you will also prosper. You will have success. Not according to human standards, but in God's eyes, you will have success. If you put your trust in the Lord, he will guide you. Some are looking for a job. Some are looking for what direction they will take in their studies. If you trust the Lord, he will guide you. And then you will prosper. You will have success. Not success according to human standards, but success in God's eyes, in God's school. We are here in God's school. And God wants fruits also in our life. In contrast to the wicked, in verse 4, you find the contrast between the godly man... And the sinner, the wicked, the wicked of verse 1, they will not have success. They will not produce fruit. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. They are under God's judgment. And finally, they will be driven away. They will not exist anymore. Yeah, of course, they will exist in hell, ultimately. In verse 5, the wicked shall not stand in the judgment. They, they, there's no ground for them to stand on. They are condemned. And so the sinners will not survive 
in the assembly of the righteous. They will have no place there. That's God's ultimate judgment. And in verse 6, Jehovah, or the Lord, knows the way of the righteous. That means God has an intimate knowledge of the way of the righteous. Whatever falls on us, whatever happens, many Christians are being persecuted. Many of you came from a country where you were in a refugee camp. Very difficult. There are Christians today who have accepted the Lord, and the next day they are beheaded. Or they were thrown in prison. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous. That means he has intimate knowledge of that, and he provides for them, he sustains them, he leads them, he helps them. But the way of the wicked shall perish. They may be very prosperous today, they may be billionaires, but what about tomorrow? Their way will perish. That's a very solemn word. John 3, we have this beautiful verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, trusts in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. God does not rejoice in the death of the sinner. He wants people to be saved. But if people do refuse to be saved, they are in the company of the wicked, and they will perish. Psalm 2 speaks of the Lord Jesus again. Psalm 1 we find a picture of the Lord Jesus, his moral picture. How beautiful he is in God's eyes. And that is the picture the Lord places for us, that we would be like the Lord Jesus, that we'll learn from him. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm humble and... Uh, the verse in uh, Matthew 11. And so the Lord wants us to learn from him so that we follow the example of Psalm 1. But when you go to Psalm 2, a few words of, uh, about Psalm 2, you have four different voices in Psalm 2. That's very interesting. The first voice is this question. Why are the nations in tumultuous agitation? They are in turmoil. That's true today. They will only get worse. And after the rapture, what is that? The rapture? We talked about it a little bit yesterday. When the Lord Jesus will come to take his own to himself, he will be gone in a split second. We talked about that yesterday. How, how wonderful, how amazing. But then the turmoil on this earth will be even worse than today. There will be tremendous turmoil. And from that turmoil, the two beasts that we talked about yesterday, Revelation 4, uh, 13, will rise. One from the sea, in connection with the nations. One from the earth, in connection with Israel. That's a time of turmoil. And they will bring stability in the turmoil. According to, door, according to their plans. But their plans will not work long. So it will end in turmoil again. What man does will always end in turmoil. And so this verse 1 refers to that turmoil, this agitation... And also they, they meditate a vain thing. In chapter 1, verse 2, we saw the meditation in the right way, according to God's mind, in fellowship with God. But here is the meditation, what's on the mind of man today. They want their strong man. They want a leader. And years back, when I was a little kid, in, in, the, in the 50s, my father told me there was the prime minister of Belgium, he said, we need a strong man, even if it is the devil will take him. That's very solemn. That's very serious. So that goes back already that time. And then you can back to the days of Hitler. They got a strong man. You go back to Napoleon. They got a strong man. <clears throat> you go back to Charlemagne. They got a strong man. But it was not the man of God. So God wants us <coughs> to follow his agenda. And then you cannot get involved in the politics of these days. Then you see we are preparing for a new world, a new order. Not the new world order that the people want in this world. We're looking for the new world order that the Lord Jesus will bring in the millennium. We talked about that yesterday. So the kings in verse 2 of the earth, they set themselves. That means they put themselves in their position, in their strengths, in their endeavors. And they plot together the princes, or the leaders of this world. We talked about the prince of the, world, of the nation that will come. There's one example. The great leaders of this earth, in contrast to the prince, the Lord Jesus. What are they plotting? They plot against the Lord. 
That's really what's happening today. They want a strong man, but it is really competition with God. We want to have the strong man according to God's mind. But here they are plotting against the Lord and against his anointed. His anointed is really the Lord Jesus. The believers are also anointed by the Holy Spirit. We are anointed ones because we belong to the anointed one, the Lord Jesus. So his anointed is God's anointed, the one God has anointed a number of times. You remember the story of David? He was anointed by Samuel. God said to Samuel, you know, you go to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem and you anoint there one of his sons that I will show you instead of King Saul. King Saul was like the Antichrist. And God said to Samuel, I want to have a different king, a king according to my heart. So Samuel went there to the house of uh, Jesse, 1 Samuel 16, and he thought, then Samuel brought, uh, excuse me, um, Jesse brought in his sons, the firstborn, looks like Saul, oh, that's him. No, God said to Samuel, it's not the outward appearance, I look in the heart. doesn't mean that the outward appearance is not important, but God looks at the heart. And so that is what Samuel had to learn, to follow God's ideas, not man's ideas. Man's ideas is to have such a strong king, strong leader, but actually it is against God. And that it is against God is shown in verse 3. Let's break their bonds asunder and cast away their cords from us. That's what's happening today. People don't want to have any limitations. They want whatever they want go into free sex, go into whatever it is. Uh, They want to have their own way. That is really summarized here in verse 3. They cast away God's cords. God's bonds are for blessing. When God makes the bond bond of man and woman in marriage, it's a bond. God does not want to take that bond uh, taken away or broken. He wants to have those bonds respected for life. And that's just one example. Another bond that God gives is the matter of government. That's why Romans 13 shows that we need to be subject to the government, to the authorities. There's one exception. If the government demands something from us that is against God's order, then we can say no. That's the only exception which confirms the rule. The rule is obey the authorities. And so if There's a lady uh, pregnant, a a sister pregnant, and then the government says, you have to abort that baby. Then we can say no. But that's the only exception. It's just an example. We we don't want to break God's bonds asunder. We don't want to throw his cords away because those bonds are for blessing. But the world doesn't see it that way. Now, the second voice is God's voice. So the first voice you can say, perhaps the voice of the prophet. Why are the nations in tumultuous agitation? Or the writer of the psalm. You don't know who wrote Psalm 1 and 2. It's not indicated. Perhaps it was David, we don't know. But in verse 2, you have the second voice. He that dwells in the heavens will laugh. So that is God. God will laugh. He He says, I will laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. So the second voice is on behalf of God. It's not necessarily God's voice himself, but the voice on behalf of God that says, He that dwells in the heavens will laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. God sees the plotting of man. He sees what's going on. He says, that's not my business. It will not succeed. Verse 5. Then he will speak to them in his anger and in his fierce displeasure he will terrify them. That we also see in the book of the prophets that God will come in in judgment and they will be greatly surprised. Why? Verse 6 says, why God comes in in judgment? I have anointed my king upon Zion, the hill of my holiness. God's plans cannot be changed. If God has planned to have his king on Zion, no matter what, if the the Muslim built the mosque, there if they say no temple God says I have anointed my king upon Zion it will happen how we don't know but God is going to make uh, sure that his plans will be fulfilled it's the hill of my holiness 
In Revelation, we see it's trampled by the nations. In Revelation uh, 11, verse 1, it's under the control of the nations. And there are plans to give the control of Jerusalem in the hands of the Pope so that he can organize things that the Jews will be happy, that the Muslims will be happy, that other parts that are there in uh, Jerusalem will be happy. It will not work. God has a plan, and that will be fulfilled. Verse 7 is the third part. I will declare the decree. Perhaps here the Lord himself is speaking. The Lord Jesus is speaking. I will declare the decree. Jehovah has said to me, thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. So he is God's son, but he is also God himself. That's a mystery. There are many people who don't want to hear that God has a son. But the Son is God. We cannot understand that. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is one. And at the same time, God the Father has a Son that's the Lord Jesus. God is eternal. His Son is eternal. How can that be? We cannot explain that. As a man, the Lord Jesus was born from the Virgin Mary, conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 1 and 2 gives the details. But we cannot understand that. It is a mystery. But here we see the Lord Jesus also as a man. He is God, blessed overall, but he is also the Messiah. He is saying this, I will declare the decree. So what God has determined. We talked about what God has determined yesterday in Cranksville's prophecy in Daniel. Here we see what God has determined. What is it? You are my son. Today I have begotten thee. So that means that God has established something and that cannot be changed. God had a plan to bring in his son into this world. So this verse may refer to his coming into this world when he was born. It also refers to his resurrection. The day that he was raised from among the dead, it was uh, realized there also. Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. God could recognize him. This is my son. Publicly God identified with the risen one. You can also relate it to what the Lord Jesus is now in heaven. God is pleased to have his son at God's right hand there in heaven. You can also apply it to the world to come. When the Lord Jesus will be introduced in public glory, God will say, he is my son. This day I have begotten him. This is my son. So God will show off, if I may use that expression, his son. God will be so happy to show to the the eyes of the whole world, This is my son. This day I have begotten. It's God is like a proud father here. He shows off his son. Verse 8. Ask of me. Now God speaks to his son. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for an inheritance. The one who was despised and rejected by his own people and by the nations. He will be ruling in glory. And God says, ask of me and I will give you the nations as an inheritance. That is his recompense. That is his reward. He will own the whole world. Already now he owns it, of course. But then it will be publicly displayed that he is the great heir. And he has all the nations as an inheritance. Now, a little break here. I'll, we'll finish in a few moments. We are co-heirs. In the New Testament, we see that God has already planned in Hebrews 1... To have the Lord Jesus, to have his son as the heir. Even before he created anything, God said, you are the heir. So God had a plan. The Lord Jesus created everything. God created everything. And it was for him the heir. And because of his death and resurrection and God's plans for us, God has joined us to him. We are co-heirs with him. Isn't that not amazing? The great heir is now sharing with us. We are co-heirs. That's not revealed in this psalm yet. That's in the New Testament. And then in verse 9, a solemn word. Thou shalt break them with a scepter of iron. So the Lord Jesus, the meek man of Galilee, if I may use that expression, he will be the ruler of this universe. And he will deal with these rebels in the right way. He will break their power. He will break them with a scepter of iron. That is his rule. The Lord Jesus is the boss. Today is the day of grace. He is the boss already. He is in charge. 
but he does not display that. Of course, for the, us, the believers, that's a reality that he is in charge. But then the whole world will see that he is the boss and he will break them as a potter's vessel. He shall dash them to pieces. That is his intervention in judgment. Now, because of those three voices, why are the nations in turmoil? He that dwells in heaven will laugh. I will declare the decree. The Lord Jesus himself is declaring that decree. Now there is a a challenge in verse 10. If this is true, what we have in this psalm, and it is true, what is the response? How do we react to that? The nations are responsible to God. We as human beings, each one of us is responsible to God because he's our creator and our redeemer. But also the nations. And we saw yesterday that the Lord Jesus is going to rule the nations. Here we have an advice to them. O kings, be wise. Consider well. Be admonished, ye judges of the earth. You better get wise. We've read about Daniel. Daniel is one of the wise men. Daniel had that feature of the wise man. The Lord Jesus was the wise man par excellence. And so here we have this advice to the nations and to the kings to also be wise and to really submit to God's thoughts. Serve the Lord with fear. That means uh, respect. There's not fear that you are trembling of fear. It is have fellowship with God. Serve him with commitment, with reverence. That's the reverential fear, the awe. But it implies Love to him. It implies submission. And rejoice with trembling. So take what God's plan is. Submit to it. God has a plan also for the nations. And they need to subject, to subject themselves to that plan. God's a plan for you and me. Did you know that? Each one of us. God has a plan for you. God wants us to submit to that plan. We have to figure it out in prayer. And then submit to that plan. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with Trembling. Kiss the son. That means not only you submit to him, you worship him. You love him. Here that's also for the nations. Of course, we have a much closer relationship with the Lord Jesus than these nations will have. But it's also to the nations to be subject to the Lord Jesus so that they will not be against him, but subject to him and have this reverential fear to serve him And that verse ends with this wonderful conclusion. Blessed are all who have their trust in him. So that is all, no exception. That's for the nations, that's for Israel, that's for you and me today. Blessed are all those who have their trust in him. Praise the Lord. May we trust him until he comes. May the Lord bless his word. If there is an urgent question, you can ask that question right now and then we can close in the word of prayer. Any questions?